Hi everyone, and welcome to Western Civilization to 1500. My name is Jason Jewell, and I'll be your instructor for this course. And uh, in this introductory lecture, we'll be talking a little bit about the terms Western Civilization, what that means, why it's important uh, to study the history of Western Civilization, and we'll talk about a couple of other foundational things that we'll need to keep in mind throughout the course. Uh, this is a, a college-level set of lectures, although um, high school, homeschool students should be able to follow along just fine, as well as adult learners. Before we get into the course content, I wanted to take a moment to uh, introduce myself to you, tell you a little bit about me and my background, to give you a little bit of orientation to the way I'm going to approach this material. I hold a PhD in Interdisciplinary Humanities from Florida State University. And that might seem a little curious to someone uh, who was expecting a PhD in history to teach this course. Uh, Thomas Sowell once wrote in one of his books that uh, interdisciplinary degree programs were suspect because very often uh, they turn out to be non-disciplinary rather than interdisciplinary. But in my defense, I will note that I do have a master's degree in history from Pepperdine University, and I have about 50 or 60 hours beyond the master's level in history as well. So I am primarily a historian by training. Uh, I would like to think that my uh, interdisciplinary background actually uh, strengthens my teaching because I do have training in several other disciplines, particularly religion, uh, literature, and the arts. And so I'd like to bring elements from those disciplines into my history courses, and I'd like to think that that uh, provides a richer and fuller experience for the students, so I hope you'll uh, come to feel the same way. I'm currently an Associate Professor of Humanities and Chairman of the Humanities Department at Faulkner University in Montgomery, Alabama. And I'm also an adjunct scholar at the Ludwig von Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama. It's through the Mises Institute that I first met uh, Tom Woods and I got to know him and eventually I became a part of this project. Uh, I also am a homeschooling father of four. At the time of this recording, my wife and I are expecting our fifth child. Uh, so that's a little bit of information about me. And uh, let's get into the content of the course and discuss the question, what is Western civilization? I'd like to discuss the phrase Western civilization by uh, breaking it down into its component parts. We'll look at each word uh, standalone and then put them back together. And perhaps the easiest word to define uh, at the beginning is the term civilization. Now, this is um, a word that uh, might be easier to define by telling uh, what it's not. And so I'd like to use an example, a very famous passage from Homer's Odyssey. Uh, you're probably familiar to, with the Odyssey to some degree, uh, particularly the famous passage out of Book 9, where Odysseus recounts his visit to the land of the Cyclops. And uh, many people remember the episode where Odysseus and his men are threatened by the Cyclops. Many of his men are killed. But I would like to read a few lines from Book 9 uh, to uh, establish the way in which the Greeks viewed the Cyclops and how in their minds, uh, the Cyclops were a barbaric people. They uh, were outside of civilization. Listen to what Homer says uh, about the Cyclops. This is Odysseus speaking in flashback. We sailed on further along and reached the country of the lawless, outrageous Cyclops, who, putting all their trust in the immortal gods, neither plow with their hands nor plant anything but all grows for them without seed planting, without cultivation. These people have no institutions, no meetings for councils. Rather, they make their habitations in caverns hollowed among the peaks of the high mountains. And each one is the law for his own wives and children and cares nothing about the others. Now to the Greek mind, uh, in the 8th century BC, when Homer probably wrote this passage, this would have been a perfect description of uh, what we might call anti-civilization. This is the antithesis of civilized life as the Greeks conceived it. So what does uh, uh, the Cyclops, uh, 
or what about this passage uh, shows that anti-civilization? Well, the Cyclops uh, clearly have society. They have some sort of uh, interaction with one another, but it is not civilization according to a Greek definition. The Cyclops do not live uh, in cities. Each family of Cyclops is isolated, and uh, life in cities is considered a key component of civilized life. In fact, our very term civilization comes from a Latin word, kiwitas or civitas, uh, which refers to the city. And so this is a very important aspect of what it means to uh, live in civilization. The Cyclops have no institutions. They have no formal ways of associating with each other, no laws, no councils, as the passage says. Uh, this has also been considered to be an important component of civilized life, that there is a certain degree of formality with the way we uh, interact with one another. And then, a very important point, the Cyclops do not have a division of labor. There seems to be no specialization. Each one uh, tends animals, uh, goes out and gathers nature's bounty. There's no cooperation socially. Uh, there's no um, craftsmen among the Cyclops, no builders, no artisans. Uh, each one is basically self-sufficient. And so to the Greek, this was a barbaric uh, way of living. The Greeks would have said, you must have cities, you must have a degree of uh, social cooperation, you must have uh, some degree of specialization uh, in your economy. These are all important parts of civilized life. But those aren't the only attributes of civilization. Uh, almost every civilization that we have records of in the ancient world uh, also has a formal religious structure. Uh, even what we would consider very primitive people had rituals for burying their dead and for offering sacrifices to the gods. And the earliest cities um, many scholars believe that they formed uh, initially as religious centers, uh, places where uh, you could go to offer sacrifices and, and uh, appeal to the gods in various ways. So a religious structure is also considered an essential part of civilization. And then, of course, we also have a very important attribute, uh, a system of writing that's necessary to have civilization. There must be some way of uh, keeping records and having uh, written communications with each other to pass information on. Uh, all of these things are considered an important part of what it means to be civilized. So when we talk about Western civilization, uh, these are many of the components that we want to keep in mind, even with the very earliest ones that we study. Now, the term Western is a little bit trickier. Uh, civilization is fairly straightforward, but with Western, uh, this term is kind of a moving target, depending on who you talk to, and many people will offer different uh, definitions of this term. In the modern world, when you uh, ask someone what it means to be Western, you might get uh, one of these definitions. Some people will respond with a political definition. They'll say, well, to be Western means that you favor democracy, uh, you favor representative government, uh, you have a concern for human rights and politics. These are all considered Western values. Others might respond with a more cultural definition. They'll say that Western civilization, or, or to be Western means that you have um, some influence of the Enlightenment on your culture. The Enlightenment is an 18th century intellectual and cultural movement that uh, stresses the importance of reason to the exclusion of other authorities such as uh, tradition or revelation. And so modern uh, people often consider uh, that to be Western means that uh, you are influenced by the Enlightenment. And then some people will propose simply a geographic definition of what it means to be Western. They'll say, oh, well, Western, that means uh, Europeans or it means Americans. And some people might in expand that definition to include Latin America because Latin America does have many uh, European roots. But uh, all of these definitions um, are fairly recent in their origin if we look at the span of human history. And I would like to propose a different definition for uh, Western. And in this course, I'll be 
uh, working from a definition of Western civilization as the civilization that has its foundations in the Hebrew and Greek cultural traditions. In the case of the Hebrews, what we are most concerned with, of course, is the spiritual legacy. Uh, these are the people who in the ancient world compiled what today we know as the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. And uh, this faith uh, gradually or eventually developed into the religion of Christianity, which is the most widely practiced religion in the world today. And the impact of the Hebrews uh, in this area has been uh, almost impossible to overestimate when we talk about its impact on the world. So this is a, a primary component of the Western tradition, the Hebrew spiritual legacy. And then we also have the Greeks. Uh, the Greeks uh, give us many ideas and many uh, institutions and ways of doing things uh, that we still use today. Uh, the Greeks are the people who develop philosophy. They pioneer uh, ways of thinking about uh, politics, education, many other aspects of life that, that in some ways we're still following in that tradition. Uh, the Greek language is also uh, very important. Uh, it's been estimated by some scholars that maybe up to 30% of the uh, vocabulary in the English language can be traced to some sort of uh, Greek root. So uh, the Greeks have a continuing influence on us today. Now the Hebrews and Greeks are the primary components of the Western tradition, but they are not the only ones, of course, and particularly for this class, we'll be looking at a couple of other groups. Uh, first of all, the Romans, who act uh, in a very important way as uh, preservers and uh, transmitters of the Hebrew and Greek ideas. The Romans conquered the Greeks militarily, but then in turn were um, influenced to a great degree by Greek culture and Greek ideas, and they made those ideas their own and preserved them. And then we also have uh, the Hebrew legacy coming into the Roman Empire in the form of Christianity. Uh, Christianity uh, spreads throughout the Roman Empire in the first few centuries of the Christian era and eventually becomes the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so the Romans combine those two traditions and then transmit them to uh, the, the future civilizations that come after them. The Romans make some uh, original contributions of their own as well. Uh, they have very important ideas about things like uh, government, uh, very scientific advances that uh, are extremely important and we'll deal with those uh, in due course. The other group that we'll focus on in this class uh, are, is the Germanic tribes who migrated into uh, Europe in the last centuries of the Roman Empire and eventually occupied Roman land and became the uh, ruling class in those regions and uh, created new political forms and systems that flourished after the Roman Empire collapsed. These people brought their own languages, their own customs, uh, their own ideas about uh, law, for example, and uh, we still live with many of those things today. Uh, the Germanic tribes have passed down many things to us. Uh, most of the Western languages, for example, English, French, uh, these are uh, influenced by the Germanic tribes. Uh, English, at its most fundamental level, is a Germanic language. And so uh, all of these groups leave their mark on Western civilization, and when we use that term Western in this class, that's what we're talking about, the civilization that has been uh, influenced by these groups of people to a very great extent. Now, why is it important to study Western civilization? Of course, there are many people uh, in our society today who will deny the importance of Western civilization and say that it's all uh, just a bunch of dead white males and we should not have any interest in that because uh, we're moving on into the brave new world of multiculturalism and uh, dead white males are responsible for all uh, the oppression in the world and so on. Well, um, I think that it's not too difficult to uh, refute these arguments. Uh, undeniably, uh, Western civilization has had a huge impact on the world. In many ways, it has shaped the society in which we live uh, worldwide, not just in uh, Europe and the Americas. 
uh, worldwide ideas about politics and education and commerce and religion, all of these different things uh, are shaped to a very great extent by the Western tradition. And if we want to understand these forces that have a big impact on the world today, we need to understand their history. Uh, many people have uh, heard the famous statement by the philosopher George Santayana, uh, those who uh, neglect to learn the lessons of history uh, or learn from the mistakes of history are, are doomed to repeat them. And so uh, it's very important to study Western civilization to have a better handle on the world in which we live. And that's not uh, just to say that uh, we look at it in a clinical and analytical way. There's also much to be gained, I think, on a personal level from studying Western civilization. All of us have been uh, bequeathed a rich cultural legacy uh, in the West. And uh, the most famous philosopher in the Western tradition, Socrates, uh, was well known for his dictum, know thyself. It's important to understand who we are, understand what influences us so we can uh, become better human beings. And if we turn our backs on study of the Western tradition, it's almost like uh, you had received an inheritance, for example, of uh, $10 million or so, and you decided that you weren't interested in that inheritance. You were just going to walk away from it and let it sit there without trying to put it to any good use. Uh, if we walk away from our cultural inheritance, we're doing something almost as foolish, I would argue. So it's very valuable to study Western civilization, uh, both for its intrinsic merits and also for what we can learn uh, to uh, apply to our situation today. Now, before we close uh, this introductory lecture, I would like to point out uh, one issue with the problems of ancient chronology. When we go back to study the ancient world and we want to um, create a timeline, we want to put dates on things, there are certain uh, issues that we run into. When we uh, travel back in time, uh, metaphorically speaking, we eventually hit a dead end in terms of uh, the unbroken timeline that we can trace events back to. We get back to the Romans, we try to go back beyond them, we don't have any sort of um, continuous civilization that comes up to our own day. And these people uh, kept records in different ways than we do, and they um, uh, tried to uh, construct their own timelines in different ways than we do. Now, most historians try to uh, solve this problem of uh, putting dates on ancient events by relying on the chronology of Egypt. Egypt has a long and unbroken civilization that goes for thousands of years up until the first century BC, at which time the Romans conquered it. So most historians will say, well, let's try to put together a timeline for Egypt, and uh, then we can date everything in Egyptian history, then we can look at other civilizations, Assyrians, Persians, whoever, and try to find correspondences between events in those civilizations with the Egyptians, and then we can sort of plug those other civilizations into the Egyptian timeline. Well, it's a fairly uh, you know, reasonable way of approaching the problem, but it does have a couple of issues with it. Uh, when we try to construct a timeline for Egypt, we run into the fact that uh, the Egyptians, particularly early on in their history, uh, did not view the passage of time necessarily in the same way that we do today. They had a cyclical view of time, which was common uh, to many ancient cultures. So they believed time moved in circles rather than in a straight line. And that affected the way they uh, kept their records. Uh, also, we have a situation in Egypt where very frequently in its history, multiple kings or pharaohs are ruling simultaneously. This is a problem because uh, the way things are dated is normally by um, the year of the particular ruler that the event happened in. So the records will say this uh, battle happened in the third year of Pharaoh so-and-so. Now, the problem arises because we don't always know specifically where the overlaps of the Pharaoh's reigns occurred. You might have had uh, one ruler uh, having control of one part of Egypt with another ruler um, ruling a different part. 
Uh, sometimes you might have a Pharaoh who elevates his son to um, the same level as himself and is sort of a co-Pharaoh and they rule together. And we don't always know precisely when these things are happening. So scholars make assumptions about what they think is reasonable and then they try to plug in these dates. Well, if their assumptions are wrong, of course, the timeline will be off. And what happens in uh, ancient studies is that frequently we see revisions of dates. Uh, if you look at textbooks that were written 100 years ago, you'll see all different dates for a lot of these um, events that occur in Egyptian history or in Assyrian history, and sometimes those dates are, are centuries off uh, what the textbooks will say today. So uh, what we need to take away from all of this is that uh, most ancient dates, at least until we get up to the time of the, the Greeks and Romans, uh, are usually tentative. Uh, they're always subject to revision. The textbooks change all the time. And so for this reason, I usually don't ask students to memorize dates, particularly from these early centuries. Um, you know, the textbooks will probably say something different five or ten years from now. There have been several times in the last hundred years when very serious uh, challenges have been raised against the standard timelines that uh, mainstream scholarship accepts. And often these uh, challenges will say, no, we're missing, uh, or we need to take away 300, 400 years from the timeline. So that, that's pretty significant. And we'll note one or two places along the way where uh, scholars have raised those kinds of objections. So this is one of these things that doesn't often get brought up in standard Western Civ textbooks, but I thought it would be useful for us to sort of put that on the table and uh, acknowledge the limits of our own knowledge about uh, some of these ancient uh, events. Now before we stop, I'll, I'll just uh, take a moment to give a, a brief overview of what we'll be covering in this course. Beginning in Lecture 2, we'll take uh, five lectures to talk about uh, the ancient Near East. Uh, this is the pure, uh, region that uh, we refer to as the Middle East today, and uh, this is where the Hebrews uh, are located geographically. Uh, that's the group that we're most interested in because of their big impact on uh, the world. But we'll also look at several other uh, civilizations from this region, uh, such as the Egyptians. The next 10 lectures, lectures 7 to 16, will deal with the world of the Greeks. And we'll begin in the uh, Aegean Sea with some of the earliest civilizations, the Minoans and Mycenaeans, and then move on into uh, Greek civilization proper and all of the, the various contributions that it has made to world history, uh, culminating in the period that we call the Hellenistic Age, uh, in which the central character is Alexander the Great. The next 11 lectures will cover the Roman world. And so we'll begin uh, with the study of the Roman Republic from its very humble beginnings um, to the time when it uh, extended its power throughout the Mediterranean world. Also in this segment of the course, we will examine the rise of Christianity and the early centuries of the Christian church and the impact uh, that it ultimately had. In the 5th century BC, we traditionally say that uh, the Roman Empire fell, at least in Western Europe, and so we'll take a few lectures to talk about uh, the fallout from that event. Uh, three different civilizations that arise out of the uh, remnants of the Roman Empire, the Latin West in Western Europe, uh, the Byzantine Empire, which is the eastern half of the Roman Empire, which did not actually fall. It maintained a continuous existence for another thousand years. And then also we'll take a lecture to uh, take a brief look at Islamic civilization. The final segment of the course uh, will deal with the Middle Ages in Europe, or the medieval period, roughly the period from 500 to 1500 AD in Western Europe. And uh, in this uh, segment of the course, we'll uh, hopefully uh, debunk the notion of this period of history as the Dark Ages. Most historians do not accept that designation anymore. Uh, there is a general acknowledgement uh, today that these centuries witnessed uh, the growth of a great civilization that had its peak in the 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, this is um, sometimes referred to as the Age of Faith, when Christianity is uh, sort of the fundamental social glue that holds the society together, 
in an age of political fragmentation. And we'll see that this period in particular uh, might hold uh, a number of lessons uh, for us today in terms of uh, politics and society. It's a very interesting period that I hope you'll enjoy studying. So in this lecture, we've touched on some uh, fundamental ideas uh, that we need to keep in mind when we study Western civilization. In the next lecture, we'll begin our exploration of ancient civilization by dealing with the region of Mesopotamia. Thanks for watching.